Good morning, everybody. It's always a pleasure to be found in God's house on a wonderful Sabbath morning, isn't it? Amen. Especially when we are opening his Bible, his, uh, the Bible, which is his word to each one of us, so that we can grow closer to him. We're going to be titled uh, this morning's um, uh, message, Come Boldly to the Throne of Grace. What a wonderful thing. So how do we do that? And this is what I love about the sanctuary. The sanctuary is all about how do I come boldly to the throne of grace? So what we're going to do is, before we start, let's just ask God to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we don't want to dare open your word unless the Holy Spirit is upon each one of us. So Lord, prepare our hearts as we get ourselves ready to hear you speak to us through your word this morning. Help it be uh, able to draw us closer and closer to you so we have that wonderful, solid, loving relationship with you. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we just um, showed with the children in the beginning in the uh, story, the children's story this morning, we see that the um, Adam and Eve, they were created perfectly. And then, and then sin came in. And sin separated that wonderful relationship with God. Now transgression of God's law is sin. And that's what it is. And so there was a law. Now because the consequences for this sin was death. So wages of sin is death. Now God's law demanded that life of the sinner. Now Isaiah 59 2, Isaiah 59 2, might as well look it up. Isaiah 59 2. Isaiah 59 2 says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So that's what had happened when Adam and Eve had sinned. The iniquities have separated that relationship with God. But the beauty thing, beautiful thing about the sanctuary, the sanctuary tells us 59.1 Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. So this is what comes through in the sanctuary message. In other words, it goes and lets us know that God is in the saving game. He didn't leave Adam and Eve destitute and died. They, he set up a plan to make sure he can bring them back again. So in his infinite love, God gave his only begotten son, that so whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So as Lorraine read in Hebrews 4.16, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. The tabernacle in heaven, like that on earth, was set up to deal with sin and it demonstrated the process that, to, for us to be able to come boldly before that throne of God. The earthly sanctuary was patterned after the, heaven, uh, the one in heaven to the extent that it was a vivid representation of the various different aspects of Christ's ministry on behalf of fallen man. In other words, it's a practical example of what is going on in heaven today to save each one of us. So we're going to see how important the sanctuary is in demonstrating the process of being united with God again. So we're going to start with the words of uh, spoken to Moses in Exodus 25, 8 and 9. So Exodus 25. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. So Exodus 25, 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So here we have an example that God wants to dwell with each one of us. But where? So he had them make a, a, a tabernacle, a sanctuary for them. Now the good thing about it with this sanctuary, it's there to go to, and it's, it's pretty hard for them, I suppose, trying to worship God. But they had this wonderful sanctuary that they can worship God in. So it's a good representation for them. So it's appropriate that there should be worship in a, te a temple. Furthermore, the sanctuary provided a visible centre for worship of the one true God. Also, it was a set up also when God's dwelling with them to go to and help them to stop going into apostasy, which is going to the uh, other, other side. So honestly, this is all about worship. So the idea of God wants our worship. He created us. He loves us. He wants us to love him back and adore him. For all that he has done. It's interesting the Hebrew word shakan means dwell, but it also means to be a permanent resident in a community. So permanent resident. It's not temporary. 
So when you see that there, that God wants to dwell with us, not temporarily, it means to be a permanent resident. It's closely related to the word Shekinah, believe it or not. We hear the word Shekinah quite randomly, um, quite frequently. But are you aware that the word Shekinah is not in the Bible? Yeah. So I did a bit of a word search. I couldn't find it anywhere. I thought, oh, that's interesting. We use it all a lot. But it's the glory. So this is the glory. So when we talk about the Shekinah glory, it's God's glory permanently dwelling with each one of us. What a wonderful thought. So basically, um, it's no accident that the very next subject that is mentioned in Exodus 25 after God explains to Moses that he wanted to dwell with us is he starts describing building the ark or making the ark. So that's got a lot of significance to it if you start looking at it. So let's have a look at that now. So we'll go through verses 10 through to 11. So Exodus 25 verses 10 and 11. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou lay, overlay it. And thou shalt uh, make upon it a crown of gold around about. So it's a beautiful thought, Noah, now. This thing here, it's now covered in gold. It's covered in gold. How big was it? So with the cubits, uh, they're normally about 17.5 inches, according to the Hebrews. But if you're looking at 1.1 metres in length, so from the tip of my fingers to roughly about here, and it's roughly about 60 uh, uh, millimetres, oh, sorry, 60 mil uh, centimetres, which is roughly about that, by about that. So that gives you a rough idea of the size of it. Now, it's wood overlaid with gold. Do you reckon it could have been heavy? Yeah, it could have had a bit of weight to it, especially with a couple of the actual... Uh, stones in there which had the Ten Commandments in there as well so the ark was basically a vessel to collect things so what was in it so the word ark it's a Hebrew it means, means to collect or to gather so that's what the word ark means so it's a chest designed to collect things put things in and that's what the word ark means so to collect so if that's the case here what sort of things would have been collected for safekeeping and so we're going to look at those as well um, Exodus 25, verse 16. Verse 16. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. So what's the testimony? So we've got to have some background or some uh, examples where we can turn around and say, well, this, the testimony was the Ten Commandments. So otherwise it's called the testimony. So let's have a look at Exodus 31. Exodus 31. And hopefully this clarifies what the actual testimony is. Exodus 31 and verse 18. Exodus 31, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of the communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So here we have it, that what was written on those stones was the Ten Commandments. So this is where it's talking about the testimony. Let's have a look at now verse, uh, chapter 32, chapter 32 of Exodus. 15 and 16 15 and 16 and Moses turned and went down from the mount and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand the tables were written on both their sides on one side and on the other were they written and the tables were the work of God and the uh, writing was the writing of God graving upon the tables so here we have us talking about now describing the Ten Commandments but the word used was not the Ten Commandments but the testimony the testimony. So basically what we've got here, the purpose of the ark was to house the Ten Commandments, uh, God's law. Because the tables of stone were a transcript of the character and will of God and were furthermore described by God's own hand, they were honoured as the most sacred object in the sanctuary. So you can imagine, it. these rocks, as they were, they were engraved by the very hand of God, his law and his covenant with each one of us. And so they're very special. And so they're very special things that are put into the Ark of the Covenant. So the law is also known as the Covenant. So just to back it up with Bible text, let's have a look at Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. Because you'll hear this, um, the language bandied around a bit when it's talking about the Ten Commandments as being the Covenant. But you want the Bible to describe the Bible or explain the Bible. 
So Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we'll go for verses 12 and 13. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, uh, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So here we have explaining what the actual covenant is. It's another way of saying the Ten Commandments. So because the ark was a chest to put the law of God in, so what else do we need to know about the ark? So let's have a look at now Exodus 25, Exodus 25, verse 17. Exodus 25, verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. So based on those measurements, that's the exact same measurements as the length and the width of the ark. So here we have it, it's going to be perfect fit on top of the actual ark. So when we think of it, this is quite interesting. Inside the ark was the law of God, God's justice. But on top of that was the mercy seat, and it's made of pure gold. What a beautiful thought it is. I like what the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, says on page 637. The Hebrew word for mercy, seat, means to cover, that is to pardon sin. Beautiful, isn't it? So in here we've got the perfect example of that. We've got God's law inside the ark, and on top of that was the mercy seat. And that's exactly what it means. It means to cover or to pardon sin. It represents, it goes on to say, it represented divine mercy. Significantly, it was of pure gold, implying that mercy is the most precious of God's attributes. Isn't it beautiful to know? God is a just God. But one of his best attributes is he's a merciful God. That gives us hope, doesn't it? It goes on to say in the commentary, it was placed over the law inasmuch as mercy transcends, or ex- which basically means to excel or surpass, justice. So as mercy transcends justice. The ark with its justice and the mercy seat with its mercy were both needed to reveal the full character of God's dealings with men. So we hear it sometimes where people say that, oh, but God's got to love. We don't want to hear about the justice side. But you think about it. If I was a father and I've got me old, um, one of my daughters bashing up on my little son. Now, I wouldn't be a, God, uh, a father of love if I didn't pull my son into line or my daughter into line who was bashing up the other one. So I'd have to go to him and warn him, don't hit your sister again or don't hit your brother again. Otherwise, I'll have to give you a smack. Now, that's the justice coming out. Now, in other words, I wouldn't be a good father if I didn't meet out justice to show that I loved him. So here we have a perfect picture of God. He's a just God because he's a loving God. The commentary goes on to say, mercy without justice is weak sentimentality, subverses of, subver- subverses of all moral order, and on the other hand, justice without mercy is moral severity, theoretically without a flaw, but revolting to both man, a God and man. So, you know, that, that's powerful you know, God finds just justice without mercy revolting so that's, that should give us a whole lot of hope goes on to say the ark and the mercy seat constituted the very heart of the sanctuary above the mercy seat was the Shekinah the symbol of the divine presence the tables of the law within the ark testified to the fact that God's kingdom is founded on an unchanging standard of righteousness and that's important God standard of righteousness does not change his law does not change he cannot change the law that'll make him a fickle god we do not serve a fickle god goes on to say which even divine grace must respect even god respects his own law grace cannot be dispensed on terms which make void the law when sin is pardoned the law's claim against the sinner must also be satisfied The very purpose of the gospel is to secure for the sinner the forgiveness of his sins by faith, by faith, in a means that does not make void the law, but establishes it. Now, that's going to be interesting. So if you think, well, how's God going to do this? Because number one, we've now sinned. The wages of sin is death. But that doesn't show a loving God. And this is the claim that Satan's making against God. Right, they've sinned, you've now got to kill them. But if you kill them, you're not a God of love. Now let's put a situation for God. The SDA Bible commentary goes on to say, 
While the tables within the ark testified against the people, the mercy seat pointed to a way in which the claims of the law could be met and the sinner saved from death, the penalty of the law. On the basis of law alone, there can be no reunion between God and man since sin separates us from God. The blood-sprinkled mercy seat must intervene for it is only on the ground of Christ's mediation on our behalf that we can draw near to God. And that's what we showed in the children's story this morning. Once that rope was severed, symbolising sin, it got cut. That relationship was cut. And the only way that those two ends of the rope could be joined was with that splice in the middle. And that was what Christ has done. You can see where the knot is. You can see the scar there. But Jesus did that for each one of us. So what else was on the ark? Let's have a look. Verses 18 to 20 on Exodus 25. Verses 18 to 20. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work thou shalt make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on one end, and, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So they're very specific where these cherubims are. One on one end, one on the other end. And verse 20, And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look um, one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt uh, put, in the mercy, uh, put the mercy seat above, the ark, uh, above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all the things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Can you see why it's important that God says to the children, I want to dwell with you, I want to dwell with you. The next thing he talks about is where am I going to dwell with you? He gets them to make the ark. So on the Ark of the Covenant, on top of the mercy seat between the two cherubim, that's where God's going to be. That's where God's going to meet with them. So when we see the, uh, with the cherubim, and they're both looking down at the actual mercy, towards the mercy seat. Below the mercy seat was the law of God. And so they're looking at the, down there, thinking about the plan of salvation in total awe and reverence and respect for it. Now, it's one of these things to think about is the angels. They are so happy of the plan of salvation. Let's have a look at Luke 2. Keep your fingers in Exodus. So Luke 2. Let's go to Luke 2. Luke 2. This is talking about the birth of Christ. So Luke chapter 2, 13 and 14. And this is when the angel came down to the shepherds. And verse 13 says on chapter 2 of Luke, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying... Now, you think about it. It's not just one angel here. A multitude of angels have come down. This is to celebrate the birth of Christ. And verse 15... Oh, sorry, verse 14. Glor and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So here we have these angels coming down, appreciating the fact that God has sent his son to save you and me. Now, if the angels are so thankful and so respectful and grateful for the plan of salvation, they're already saved. Shouldn't we be a lot more grateful than what we are at times? So we've got to put things in perspective, eh? Alan White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, 349, Above the mercy seat was the Shekinah, the manifestation of the divine presence, and from between the cherubim, God made known his will. So it just reinforces that that's where God resides. Great Controversy, page 415. In the temple in heaven, the dwelling place of God, his throne is established in the righteousness and judgment. In the most holy place is his law and, great, and the great rule of right by which all mankind are tested. That's the judgment. The ark that enshrines the tables of the law is covered with the mercy seat before which Christ pleads his blood in the sinner's behalf. And so the whole sanctuary message all points to coming to the Ark of the Covenant in the Day of Atonement. But there's a way of getting there, and that's quite important as well. So we're also going to look at what else was in the Ark. 
Because a lot of people think that the only thing in the ark was the, the law or the covenant. But let's have a look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. So Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. So Hebrews chapter 9. And we go to verses four, uh, 3 to 5. 3 to 5. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein, which is what was inside, was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So when it's talking about here, so we had now inside the pot of manna. So what's the history with that? So let's flick back down to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. Exodus 16. So Exodus 16, if you remember, is talking about when um, the children of Israel were moaning and groaning, they've got no tucker. And so you know, God goes to and rains matter down for them. And if you know the story, they said, what's this? And in Hebrew, that's manna. And so basically what we got is they said manna. So that's why it's called manna, because it means what's this? Because they didn't know what it was. They've never seen it before. So here we got down in verse um, 32 to 35 of chapter 16. So verses 32 to 35. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it, this is the manna, to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherein I have fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord, to be kept for your generations. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. So we've got the picture here. So why was the pot of manna in the Ark of the Covenant? It's simply to show that how God has sustained them. He brought them out of Egypt, and out of, brought them out of slavery, and he sustained them. And so when they look at that, they, they can't go looking in the Ark, but they knew it was in the Ark of the Covenant. So every time they hear about the Ark of the Covenant, they know that that pot of manna is in there. And that's always going to remind them of how God has led them out of slavery or sin for our situation and also had how God sustained them. Then on top of that, don't forget, it also reminds you of the Sabbath law because they had a double portion on Friday and they weren't to go and collect anything on Saturday. So we've got a double influence in the Ark of the Covenant, which is the central part of the actual temple or the sanctuary, which is reminding us of the seventh day Sabbath. We've got God's law written on the tables of stone, and also we've got the pot of manna to remind us. Also, there is the uh, Aaron's rod that budded as well, remember? So let's have a look at Numbers, Numbers 17. So let's turn to Numbers 17. So in Numbers 17. Now, if you know a bit of the history of what happened here with the um, Numbers chapter 16 is all talking about a what? Do you remember? remember? A rebellion. Korah, uh, Dathan, and Ab Abraham. Not Abraham, Abraham. Sounds like I've got a stutter, but that's the three, three young fellas. And what they were doing is they were moaning and groaning to Moses. They were saying to Moses, well, you got us out of the slavery. You've got us into this desert. You said we're going to the promised land and we ain't there yet. Who appointed you princes over us? And they said, well, what right have you got to lead us? That was basically their attitude. That was their attitude. So Moses had to set up a couple of tests for them. So overall, you have um, both of them, Korah, Dathan and Abraham, they were at the tents and Moses gave them a, uh, a test. They said, if you die of old age, basically, that means I was wrong. But if the earth opens up and swallows you, your families, your tents and all your belongings, God chose us. 
And as soon as Moses finished talking, the earth opened up and down they went and it closed up once they went down. That wasn't adequate enough. So after that, all, there's 250 princes took their senses with incense to challenge Moses and Aaron. Fire came down and burnt the th- all, a whole lot of them up. So there's 250 people plus the families of those three men. doesn't go on there. In v- chapter 17 of um, Numbers, and you, you read this for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. Read this for yourselves. In chapter 17, it goes on, there was a test got done now. All the leaders of the 12 tribes, they all took a rod each. They put their names on the rods. Aaron put his name on his rod. And Moses said that we were going to put them in, present them to the Lord in the sanctuary. And whichever one buds, because this is what God told Moses to tell the people, the one's rod that buds, that is the one I've chosen. And so they left him in there overnight. And the next day, uh, Moses goes in and collects the rods, brings them out. And Aaron's rod, which is dead, it's a dead stick, had blossomed and it also bore almonds. And so we've now got the picture now. So that's the importance of this. So why was that in the sanctuary? So let's have a look at now, chapter uh, 17, verse uh, 10. Verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. Against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take Uh, quite take away their murmurings from me and there's a reason that they die not so why was Aaron's rod put in the Ark of the Covenant because basically it's put there simply to remind people of what's going to happen if you rebel against God's will why because God doesn't want people to die the murmurings were against Moses and if you murmur against Moses who has been appointed by God you're actually murmuring against God. And so can you see the importance of having the covenant, which is the tables of stone, Aaron's uh, rod, and also the pot of manna. It's a whole message there, and you'll find that the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines are all based on the Ark of the Covenant. Everything's there. You've got things like the state of the dead. Why? Because you've got the judgment. So we don't die and just go to heaven because there's a judgment. So that tells us that we're going to be judged. Then we go to heaven if we're acceptable to God or not. So you've got all these doctrines. The seventh day Sabbath is there. It's the Ten Commandments are still in the Ark of the Covenant. You've got all these doctrines can be based back onto here. So we've got these things in place. So I hope it makes sense now. All right, so um, that's why they are in the actual covenant. So important parts to have in, that, uh, in the actual covenant itself in the uh, ark sorry god is particular in the way that we worship him would you agree that's evidence specific um the way the sanctuary services were held and also the way that we worship god today because he's specific because everything brings glory and honor to god through his son jesus christ and if you take jesus christ out of the equation that's a massive slap in the face to god saying that we do not accept your free gift. This is why it's important that we understand what goes on. So do you all understand the, or remember the story of Uzzah? Remember when the, the Israelites are having a bit of a fisty cuffs with the Philist- uh, Philistines? And whatever, they have a bit of a battle with them. They weren't doing too good because they were rebelling against God. So the Philistines were getting the upper hand. So they decided to take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. Because they think, well, the presence of God with us, we're sure to win. They were overcome by the Philistines. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant captive. And if you remember the story, it's quite, I I like God's sense of humour. They put it in the temple of Dagon. The next morning, Dagon has fallen off his perch, face first, face down, in front of the Ark of the Covenant, as if he's worshipping it. They stood him back up again. The next morning, he'd fallen down. This time his head was removed and his arms had fallen off. They thought, oh, this is no good. So they moved him around to all the different cities. Now, basically, God sent a plague of boils. And, and there's slight destruction coming on five cities. So they thought, oh, this is not good. So they decided, okay, we better get rid of this thing. So what did they do? They went and built a, a, a new cart, put two oxen in front of it. They just gave birth to little cows, calves. All right? And they said, okay, we're going to put the Ark on, on it. So they put the Ark of the Covenant on the back of this new car, uh, cart. And they said, okay, if these 
scales take this thing away and leave their calves behind, this must be of God. And it happened. And it happened. So we get the story. So let's have a look at now. We're going to now have a look at, uh, read 1 Samuel. So go to 1 Samuel. First of all, go to 1 Samuel. We'll read chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. So going on with it, once a cart landed, um, uh, they went to him and found it. And they, uh, there's quite a few people, they started looking in some of the Israelites and started looking into the ark because they thought, this is great, we can have a look in it. But out of that there, there's quite a few of them got killed So because they were looking into the ark. So it's not really good. So there's, what, 50,000 and 70 men were killed for looking into the ark. That's Israelites. So God is very particular because don't forget, that's a holy, sacred bit of a furniture and God was particular about how that was supposed to be looked after so chapter 7 verses 1 to 3 and the men of Kirajoram came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it unto the house of Abimadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord and it came to pass while the ark abode at Kirajoram that the time was long for it was 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. The rest of that chapter goes on to say how the Philistines attacked. The people turned their hearts to God, and God overcame them. God overcame them. And if we have now looked in verse 12 of chapter 6, then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpeth and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Remember we just sung that in the second verse on the second hymn. So here I raise my Ebenezer. So when you're singing that song, just think about it. It basically means a stone of help. So when you're singing that song, think about how God has led you in the past. Let's now go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we'll read verses 1 to 7. So, this is where they're going to be bringing the, the ark back home now. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Now, that's one big party. And David uh, rose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up uh, uh, from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. So they didn't use it in any old cart. They got a brand new cart and brought it out of the house of Abimadab that was in Gebiah uh, and Uzzah and Ahiah. Uh, the sons of uh, Abin Abimadab drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abimadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahiah went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. So they are so happy that the ark of God was coming home. And when, verse 6, And when they came to nation's threshing, threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Was God happy about that? Verse 7, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him. God killed him. So you can argue the case that that's not very nice because all Uzzah was trying to do was what? Steady the ark. But what was the problem? Let's have a look at the rest of verse 7. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and, the, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased. So what was his error? So let's go back to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, verses 12 to 15. This is talking about the making of the ark. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And the two rings shall be in one side of it, and the two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be 
born with them. What does it mean to be born with them? Carried. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So how is the ark supposed to be transported? Carried. Born. As we said earlier on, it might have been a little bit on the heavy side. Would have been a bit awkward. They've seen how the Philistines sent the actual uh, ark of the covenant back home. So let's just do what the other surrounding nations do, shall we? Let's just worship God the way that they did it. They got away with it. Why don't we do that too? So they did. And this is basically what it comes to. So do we at times think that we can drop the standards of God's worship because it suits us better? But they're doing that out there. Why can't we do that in here? God is particular. God is very particular in the way we worship him. So that nobody was supposed to touch the ark, were they? Nobody. I like how the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 625 says, it says the ark was holy. None but the priests or the descendants of Aaron were to touch it. And you find that in Numbers 4.15. God is strict regarding his requirements. True, the Philistines had touched the ark and no harm had resulted, but they could not be held accountable for what they did not know. The Israelites, however, knew the instruction that the Lord had given, but they disobeyed it. Very similar to Adam and Eve, wasn't it? So this was a holy dwelling place of God. You could not desecrate it. So you've got a person who was common, Touching something holy. God had to act. Because when you think of it, the only way that we can come to God is through Jesus Christ, his son. And if you have a look at the way it's set up in the sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant is in the most holy place. For you to get access to that, you have to come through the court, through the holy place, then into there on the uh, Day of Atonement. So we'll go through that in a bit more detail. Okay, let's have another look example of something critical. What about Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu? Let's have a look at Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. And Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out, of, out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So one of the things is, this in context, this is just after the, um, the sanctification or the acceptance or the dedication of the sanctuary. This is the first service going on in the sanctuary after it has been de- dedicated. So let's have a look at a couple of texts before. So Leviticus 9, 23 and 24. Leviticus 9. So go back a little bit. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So God sent down a signal that he accepted the workmanship of that sanctuary. He sent fire down from heaven and consumed the burnt or the, um, the sacrifice on the altar of burnt offering. So God lit that fire. God lit that fire. That was a fire that was never to go out. Never to go out. So we see this coming through. Um, do you reckon the boys knew... Aaron's sons knew what was expected of them. Definitely. The lead up to the dedication of the sanctuary, they were indoctrinated with what they had to do. They had it all given to them. It was all explained to them. But when they came to perform their duties, they didn't obey God's word. They didn't obey. There's the A Bible commentary page, uh, this is volume one, page 748, 749. It says this. This is talking about the strange fire. It was not taken from the altar of burnt offering, whose fire God himself had kindled and which was therefore sacred. So in the congregation, there would have been these other little fires going on, which is common fire for a priest to cook their tucker and that on. 
but they probably took it from there. But it doesn't actually say in the Bible, but it was common fire. It was not sacred fire. Now, this is critically important, the significance of where you take the fire from. And we're going to explain in a bit more details. Let's have a look at now Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16, 12 and 13. Leviticus 16, 12 and 13. Leviticus 16, 12 and 13. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals from the fire from off the altar before the Lord. This is talking about the altar of burnt offering before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. So before he went in there to light his incense, he had to get the fire or the coals from off the altar of burnt offering because that's the one that God sent down to say, yes, I accept that sacrifice. So that sacrifice represented who? Jesus. So that sacrifice represented Jesus. So the fire coming down from God says, I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is symbolic in that sacrifice of burnt offerings. So he's saying, right, that's accepted. Now, if you take fire from somewhere else, that's not an acceptable fire because that's not been approved by God to say that sacrifice is now accepted. Some people can't say, oh, that's been pretty petty. But the significance is huge. It's saying that you say you do not need Christ's sacrifice for you. And this is where it comes to. Uh, SDA Bible Commentary, uh, Volume 1, page 775. It says, The bullock had been killed and its blood kept uh, in a basin by one of the priests. Before entering with the blood, Aaron took coals from the altar of burnt offering and filled his censer. He took also two handfuls of incense, which he placed on the coals after entering the most holy place. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 715. At a designated place upon the altar of burnt offering where a fire was always burning, it was the duty of the priest to make sure that this fire never went out because, this, because God himself had kindled it. It was considered sacred fire. This fire must not be put to common use nor must, be, uh, must common fire be used in any sanctuary service. From this central fire on the altar, the priests lighted other fires to accommodate such sacrifices as might be brought. Thus several fires were burning on the altar at one time, all lighted from the one central fire. It was from this altar that the priests took the coals, took the coals for their senses when they went in to offer incense in the holy place. The fire on the altar of incense came from the altar of burnt offering. It's interesting we see here, Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 359, all had been done as God commanded and he accepted the sacrifice and revealed his glory in a remarkable manner. This is talking about the dedication of the sanctuary. Then fire came down from the Lord and consumed the offering upon the altar. The people looked upon the wonderful manifestation of divine power with awe and in intense interest. They saw it in a token of God's glory and favour and they raised a universal shout of praise and adoration and fell on their faces as if in an immediate presence of Jehovah, which they were because a cloud came into the sanctuary. But soon afterward, a sudden and a terrible calamity fell upon the family of the high priest. At the hour of worship, as the prayers and praise of the people were ascending to God, Two of the sons of Aaron took each his censer and burnt fragrant incense thereon to rise a sweet odour before the Lord. But they transgressed his command by the use of strange fire. For the burning of the, burning the incense they took common instead of the sacred fire which God himself had kindled and which he had commanded to be used for this purpose. For this sin a fire came out from the Lord and devoured them in the sight of the people. So it sounds very similar, but when it comes to the incense, the importance about the incense, um, let's just refresh on that because we uh, got, had that covered just a while ago. Uh, let's have a look at Exodus 30, Exodus 30, because you're going to see the similarities here. And when they combine the, the common fire with the incense, it's critical that they got it from the right spot. Exodus 30, 34 to 37. Exodus 30, 34 to 37. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacked, and onica, and galbium, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection, after the art of the apoper, uh, apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourself according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. So here we've got, there's a recipe for the incense. And that could not be used for any other purpose. That recipe was purely for sacred things. So let's have a quick look why. Let's have a look at quick why. Um, the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 660 says, The fact that the coals for the altar of incense were brought from the altar of burnt offering points to the truth that the heart of the worshipper must be reconciled to God before God will accept his prayers and devotion. Interesting. So let's have a look at Psalm 66. Psalm 66, and we'll start winding up. Psalm 66. Psalm 66. So Psalm 66, uh, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Simple. So unless I've asked for forgiveness and go through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ and ask for forgiveness of my sins, God will not hear us. So let's have a look at another text. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. So Proverbs 15, verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So it's saying if we ask for forgiveness of our sins and Jesus covers us with his righteousness, our prayers are heard by God. So you get the picture. Now let's have a look at the significance of this incense. As I said, it was covered a while ago, but I'm just trying to tie it in that God is so particular about the way that we come to him. And there's a reason for it. Let's have a look at now. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. So Revelation 5, verse 8. Revelation 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of the saints. So it's saying that these odours are the prayers of the saints. But then we go to uh, Revelation 8, 3. Revelation 8, 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So we're saying now that the incense now is not necessarily the prayers of the saints. There's no contradiction here. So let's have a quick look at Ephesians 5, 2. Ephesians 5, 2. Ephesians 5, verse 2. Bear with me. It's all coming together. It's like a little sum, a mathematical equation here. Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. So we've got the whole picture together now. So before we can actually present our prayers to God, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, which can only be done through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the altar of burnt offering. That's why the coals must come from there, because that was the offering, that was the fire that God had accepted. So the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, now this is important to every one of us, that Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us was accepted by God. So the symbolism reinforces that. So we had to take the coals, well the priest had to take the coals from off the altar of burnt incense, the uh, off, bolt off burnt offering, sorry, then put it in the censer, and they put the incense, which was Jesus' sacrifice again, it symbolises that, 
and wants to sacrifice because Jesus is atoning blood. Well, Ephesians 2, 5 2 start telling us that is his offering, his sacrifice with a sweet, sweet smelling aroma that was put also into all of the coals and the sweet smell coming up together was a combined effort thing. So if we use any common incense, it's mixing common with sacred. If we use common fire, it's mixing common with sacred. Brothers and sisters, I hope it makes sense because God is particular in how we worship him. And this is the important part about the sanctuary service. Everything points to Jesus Christ. If you have a look at the court, first off, Jesus, he was out, he come to dwell with us in the camp. He had to live that perfect life so he can live that perfect life because one of the commands is, well, breaking, the court, uh, breaking God's law, God's law de- de- uh, required perfection or perfect obedience. We didn't do that. But Jesus came to live that perfect life to fulfill the requirements of the law. He had to take on humanity because it was a kinsman that could only redeem a slave. So he had to take on humanity to do that. But then he progressed from the, uh, the camp. He went into the courtyard to the altar of burnt offering. That's when he went to the cross. So he paid the penalty, the wages of sin is death. Then the resurrection is through the laver. As he ascended through the laver into the holy place, the, uh, the showbread, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The candlesticks, he said, I am the light of the world. And we've just talked about in Ephesians 5, 2, about his sacrifice is the sweet-smelling aroma. That's how we come to the throne boldly. God sought to impress upon Israel that forgiveness of sin can be obtained only through confession and administration of blood. They were to realise the infinite cost of forgiveness, the infinite cost It is more than merely overlooking faults. It cost God something to be able to forgive. It cost a life, even the life of his own son. To shortcut this sacrificial system, I'll say it again, to shortcut this sacrificial system is to trivialise the gift of God, his only begotten son. In in conclusion, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Instead of vain, laborious attempts to earn salvation by rigorous compliance with requirements of any system of religious, righteous um, systems of religious requirements, the Christian has the privilege of free access. We've got free access to the grace of a loving Father through Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, we do come to Jesus just as we are, sinful as we are. We come to Jesus Christ. And it's through his mediation, it's through his sacrifice that he presents our case to God. But if we go straight to God, we're saying we don't need Jesus. That's a slap in the face for God. We need grace to endure endure the hardship and suffering and grace to overcome temptation. That's what it's talking about here. He who makes it a a habit to come daily to the throne of grace for a fresh supply of God's mercy and grace enters into the rest of soul God has provided for every sincere believer. We come there for a feed of free grace. We'll have that perfect peace. Our worship must enhance our appreciation, dependence, and relationship with God and his wonderful son, Jesus Christ. Shall we come boldly to the throne of God now? Shall we stand and sing our last hymn? Four, one, two, I think it is. Yeah. Shall we stand and sing four, one, two, cover with his life?
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sanctuary message. Lord, we appreciate the Ark of the Covenant. It represents your character. The law is a reflection of your character. The mercy seat is a reflection of your character. The Ark of the Covenant is your throne where you sit and you dwell with us. So, Lord, we thank you so much for that. But also we thank you for the rest of the sanctuary message which shows that without Jesus, we just can't come to you as a holy, sacred being. We as sinful natured, natured creatures, we must come through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that Jesus come to live that perfect life. We thank you that Jesus come to die, to pay the penalty, the wages of sin is death. We thank you he didn't just stop there. He progressed on to his raised from the dead. He's now ministering for us in the heavenly sanctuary. So Lord, everything points to Jesus. Lord, we are so indebted to you in the plan of salvation. Lord, we do pray that the Holy Spirit be upon each one of us as we leave here today. May we be impressed upon the importance and the sacredness of your message. And Lord, may we be drawn closer and closer to you as we see the significance of what Jesus Christ has done for each one of us. Help us to grow in your grace. Help us to remember to come to you for grace on a regular basis, daily basis and hourly basis. The power to overcome sin, we need the grace to do that. So Lord, we thank you so much. But Lord, be with us each one as we go forward from here. So may our joy be overflowed so much that we can't help but share it with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.